Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Trinity. Uh, we will prepare our hearts and minds with the prelude by Gary Wood. Good morning. I'm glad that you've joined us today. Um, the uh, Zoom coffee hour will follow the service and the meeting information for that will be in the comments. So please join me in starting with our call to worship. No one is an island. We are all joined in Christ Jesus. Who else is like you, loving God? Who is like you, beautiful in holiness, awesome in all the things you do for us? No one lives by themselves. No one dies by themselves. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Our first hymn is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in might inaccessible, hid from our most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in Thy justice like mountains, I soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. To all my thou givest, to both great and small, in all my thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish like leaves on the tree, and wither and perish, a 
doth not change a thing. Thou reignest in glory, thou dwellest in light. Thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. O Lord, we would render all help us to see. Tis only the splendor of my tiger Now I invite Matt to lead us in prayer and scripture. The Lord be with you. And also Thank with you. you. Let us pray. O Lord, Lord God, God, merciful, merciful judge, judge. You are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In our readings today, uh, Jacob's death, the brothers of, of Joseph, begged for forgiveness for the crime they had done against him. You intended to do me harm, Joseph said, but God used this as an opportunity to do good and save many lives. This comes to us from Genesis, the 50th chapter. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we had done to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. I am in the place of God. Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. And your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. Let us be good. And in this Christian community has significant struggles with diversity. Here, Paul helps us understand that despite different practices in worship, personal piety, and opinion, we do not judge one another. All Christians belong to the Lord Jesus Christ who died for all of us and will judge each of us. This is from Romans, the 14th chapter. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak only eat vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. All those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. 
So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. This is the word of the Lord. For our gospel today, we're, we're hearing about when uh, Peter asks about the limits of forgiveness. Jesus responds with a parable that suggests human forgiveness should mirror the unlimited mercy of God. From the 18th chapter of Matthew, it's written, Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sinned against, sins against me, how many times should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slave. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand pounds was brought to him. And he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, and said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and, and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their lord, all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you have not had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you. If you do for not, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord Jesus Christ who calls us to forgive 77 times. Well, in this gospel story from Matthew, Peter is again not thinking like God. He comes to Jesus with this question, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Peter is not thinking like God because he's looking for a limit on forgiveness. Only seven times. You know, it's interesting. In the Gospels, Peter seems to understand that forgiveness is a big thing for Jesus. After all, he's heard Jesus forgive sins of many people. He's even heard Jesus get in trouble with religious leaders for forgiving the sins of certain kinds of people. He's heard in the Beatitudes that peacemakers are blessed, that blessing comes in being merciful 
He has seen thousands of people fed and the sick healed because of Jesus' compassion, not because of whether they deserved it or not. Yet, Peter never quite enters into God's way of thinking, at least not yet. Peter's thinking is still very human, much like ours. So if someone sins against me, and the implication in Peter's question is that this is a repeated sin, how many times should I forgive? There's got to be a limit to that, doesn't there? I can't just go on forgiving this person indefinitely. Well, Jesus basically says, yes, we need to practice forgiveness every time. 77 times, in fact. That number seven is a biblical number that represents completion and wholeness. So this is about becoming a whole person. God's thinking is very different than our human thinking. While Peter is looking for a limit to his practice of forgiveness, Jesus and God do not. Practicing forgiveness is part of what it means to follow Jesus. Forgiveness is actually part of who God is. You know, we read, didn't read this part today in our gospel, but right before this uh, conversation with Peter and Jesus, the disciples are arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They're expecting Jesus to overthrow the Roman Empire, and they want a piece of that action. Again, it all comes out of more human thinking. So what does Jesus do? He places a little child in their midst and he says, you have to become like children to be the greatest. Jesus won't tolerate those stumbling blocks in God's kingdom. In other words, people who put roadblocks up to people's faith, like limiting forgiveness to seven times or like in the Romans lesson when they're bringing new people into the faith, but apparently only to argue with them about opinions rather than to nurture them in the faith. As people of God, we are not to be stumbling blocks to other people's faith. A colleague of mine this week pointed out how we humans like to be bean counters. In other words, we like to keep track of things. We like to keep track of how often people hurt us, or we like to keep track of who's doing what. We keep track of how many times people have hurt us. We keep track of how many times our neighbors and fellow church members do something wrong. Yet we're slow to count our own beans. You know, how many times have I hurt someone in the church or hurt my family or my spouse or my kids or my parents? How many times has so-and-so done that to me? I might argue that we are selective bean counters, usually counting in our favor. So it doesn't surprise me that, like Peter, we may also want to count out forgiveness. After all, you can only forgive so many times, right? Well, Jesus says, no, not seven, but 77. In other words, every time. As my colleague the other day also said, God's math isn't our math. In God's kingdom, one plus one does not equal two. In God's kingdom, one plus one equals zero. God wouldn't pass today's math class. And thank God that he wouldn't. If God were a bean counter like us, we would be sunk. But he isn't. And that's what God expects of us. That's what God expects of those who follow Jesus and follow God's ways, to think and act like him. And this is where Jesus' parable comes in. So it's like a king who shows lavish mercy and forgiveness on his servants. But then when the servant does not show the same kind of mercy and forgiveness to his fellow servant, the king is furious and throws him in jail, and all kinds of terrible things happen. 
If the unforgiving servant is going to be a bean counter, then he will suffer the consequences of that counting. But just imagine if the servant who experienced lavish forgiveness had shared that forgiveness with his fellow servant, life would have turned out very differently for everyone. The parable is not about counting sins, ours or God's. It's about changing. That's what much of the biblical story is about. God sends prophets to call the people back to his ways. Jesus comes to call people back to God's ways and become the people that God created them to be. Ones who are forgiven and ones who practice forgiveness. Just like we pray in our Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Of course, if we're counting sins, like Peter, that may backfire on us. God doesn't count our sins against us, and his expectation is that we do the same. God's expectations are that we change to become more like him, that we turn back to him, that we take on the mind of Christ, turn away from the things that harm and hurt others and ourselves, God's forgiveness expects a change in our behavior. Like in the Gospel of John, when he says to the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. Or in the Gospel of Luke with Zacchaeus, who has exploited the people he's collecting taxes from. And when he changes, he pays out reparations to all those he has exploited. And as we see from Joseph, in our Old Testament lesson today, forgiving his brothers yet again for selling him into slavery, calming their fears that he is still counting their sin and won't forgive them now that their father is dead. But forgiveness has transformed both Joseph and the brothers. They can now be reconciled to one another and move on. I want to acknowledge two things about forgiveness before we go. The practice of forgiveness can be complicated, and every situation of harm that we encounter will have many facets to it. However, I think Jesus' teaching here to always try to practice forgiveness is a good guideline to follow in our lives because forgiveness can lead to transformation and change both for us and the person who hurt us. Counting sins and limiting forgiveness just ends up keeping us in bitterness and resentment. And the other thing about forgiveness is it is hard. It's hard because we have to be vulnerable in order to practice it. But know this, that as you seek to practice forgiveness, God's Holy Spirit walks alongside of you to give you courage and peace. Know that Jesus has shown us what forgiveness looks like, unconditional, unlimited, on a cross, in an empty tomb, coming out of the tomb. The very incarnation of God's love among us. And hopefully you have a community of faith to encourage you as you practice forgiveness. So let's turn our thinking back to God's way of thinking. Not seven, but 77, where one plus one equals zero, where forgiveness plus always equals transformation. Amen. Our hymn is Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. Thank mm-hmm. you.
Peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a word of God's peace with one another in the comments as we prepare for Matt to lead us in prayer. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. You welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of radical welcome. Strengthen faith through Bible studies and Sunday schools, confirmation classes, youth ministries. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our, Hear prayer. our prayer. The heights of the heavens show us the vastness of your steadfast love. Have compassion on your creation, especially those suffering from wildfires in California and Oregon, where human selfishness has brought ruin and destruction. We look to your spirit to help us turn from those, those ways to heal, renew, and redeem your world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom, especially our president, governor, and mayor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our hear prayer. Our prayer. Bring healing and justice wherever harm is dealt. Provide vindication for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger. And guard refugees fleeing famine, poverty, and war. We continue to keep Kenosha, Portland, in California and Washington, and the Gulf states in our prayers. We also lift before you those who are ill, dying, or facing surgery. Jacob, David, Jim, Sue, Iris, Gallon, Joyce, Fred, Jerry, Dallas, Lexi, Paul, and those we name in our hearts and in the comments. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Still our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. 
Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. We thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness. We ask for your presence with the family and friends of Sarah Lotto. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy. Through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be your name. name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We will continue now with the hymn, Rise, Shine, You People. been forgiven. Now go into the world that needs your forgiving, healing touch. Bring peace and hope to others, sharing the story of Jesus Christ so all may experience God's love. Amen. Gary's running up to the balcony and then we'll have our postlude. 